Isabel and I are so pleased to have uh, Lumpur Pasano joining us today for uh, this interview. And I'll just uh, read a quick biography of Lumpur and then we'll jump into questions. Um, so Lumpur Pasano was born in Manitoba, Canada in 1949. Um, and he is the most senior Western disciple of Venerable Cha in the United States. Um, after finishing his studies at the University of Winnipeg, Lumpur traveled to Asia through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, to India, Nepal, and finally Thailand, where he traveled to Wat Blang Vipassana Meditation Monastery in Chiang Mai. After a month-long silent retreat, Lumpur took what he thought would be a temporary ordination in January of 1974 at the age of 24. So that temporary ordination grew in length and profundity uh, when Lumpur traveled with his teacher uh, to meet Lumpur Cha with whom he asked to stay and train. Being one of the early residents of Wat Ba Nanachat, the International Forest Monastery in Ubon, Thailand, Lumpur Pasong became its abbot in his ninth year as a monk. During his incumbency there, Wat Ba Nanachat developed considerably, both in physical size and reputation. Spending about 24 years living in Thailand, Lumpur Pasno became a well-known and highly respected monk and Dhamma teacher. He moved to California on New Year's Eve of 1997 to share the abbotship of Abhaigiri with Ajahn Amaro. In 2010, Ajahn Amaro uh, moved to Amaravati, leaving Lumpur Pasano to serve as sole abbot of Abhaigiri for the next eight years. In the spring of 2018, Lumpur Pasano stepped back from the role of abbot, leaving the monastery for a year-long retreat abroad, and has since returned from his sabbatical and serving as the anchor of wisdom and guidance for the Abhaigiri community. Uh, Lumpur Pasano is the author of many books, um, of which you can find at the Abhayagiri website. Um, those include The Island, which is a great anthology of the Buddhist teachings on Nibbana, and among many other books. And Lumpur Pasano is also uh, my preceptor, so I owe my monastic life to Lumpur Pasano. So Lumpur, thank you so much for agreeing to, to meet with us. Yeah. Um, so in preparing for this, um, I realized that I've got about about 84,000 uh, questions. So this, we might have to uh, do another series. The list really is long. I'm looking at it's it. It's a long <laughs> list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, it could end up uh, you know, like a, one of these en endless television series. <laughs> <laughs> we would love that, Lumpur. We would love it. Yeah, multiple series. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I just wanted, I thought it would be good to start off with um, your teachings on gratitude. I've found that that's something um, which uh, I won't say it's unique, but I, I did find it um, quite profound coming to meet you and hearing you teach explicitly on the quality of gratitude and just living, living gratitude, your gratitude for Lumpur, uh, Lumpur Cha, and um, yeah, just how gratitude is a part of Dhamma practice. And I was wondering if you could speak to, um, yeah, people who don't yet see the value of gratitude in a Buddhist practice and, you know, see the value in actually finding fault and seeing faults and being able to, you know, make these kind of discernments and not really paying so much attention to gratitude um, on the opposite end of that, that spectrum of looking out at the world. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's when you look out at the world, um, you know, you're, you're making choices and, and what you, you have to sort of make a, make a choice, you know, do I want, do I want to suffer more or suffer less? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, there's a, uh, if you look at it that clearly, it's sort of like, uh, it, it's like a no brainer. Um, why would I want to fill my mind and my heart with more, more criticism, more negativity, uh, more competition, more comparing, um, uh, more, more gaining, more achieving, because that's, that's what, what the world runs on. And, and that's, uh, it hasn't really worked for how many millennia now. Uh, so <clears throat> it's worth uh, turning attention to something that 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 actually feels better, uh, and so that gr looking in through the lens of gratitude, and you realize that that as a <clears throat> uh, 
uh, uh, any existence. Um, yeah, we're not, we are not autonomous. <laughs> we're not autonomous packages of meat. I mean, it's, just, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> you know, we actually, uh, our, our senses uh, uh, and our heart are in connection with the world around us and we interact and we have to interact uh, so that, that uh, you know, trying to prop up the, <clears throat> the sense of uh, 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 an autonomous individual and personality is just really painful and, and tiring. <clears throat> so to be able to recognize that we are intrinsically uh, and, and inevitably bound to the world around us, just through the senses and through the, our feelings and perceptions and emotions and uh, memories. And so that to, to be able to <clears throat> uh, turn to a quality that helps to uh, brighten the heart and, and to, to illuminate the mind so we can see clearly and, 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 and feel uh, feel better, feel good. Um, then we can then we can start interacting with the world and with those interdependencies from a place of well-being and generosity and giving. Because you realize that with gratitude, you know, we receive a lot, uh, and to be able to be, have that quality of gratitude and then to uh, replenish that pool of well-being and goodness um, and being being a part of that rather than you know what can I get what can I achieve what can I what can I keep for myself and it's so pathetic uh, so it's uh, it you know and, and it hurts um, and and and, and uh, you know and it's not you know and it's not looking at things in a <clears throat> in a, uh, uh, you know, it's not like you're trying to gloss over the, the, uh, the, the, the realities of, um, yeah, the, the egregious nature of, of many, the, you know, many aspects of the human condition and, and human beings. But um, it's, you know, what do we, what do we want to act from? And it's really important to realize you have that agency uh, and you can you can can rely on that and that's that builds the foundation for increased um, wisdom discernment and and uh, and living from a place of, of compassion <clears throat> thank you long for in terms of you know keeping that pool of gratitude filled um, I feel like the people's interaction often with news and the news cycle is a sort of continual drain on that pool. Um, how would you advise, you know, people working with uh, news, news intake and current events in such a way that, you know, they can protect their practice um, and, you know, move from that place of gratitude um, well, tur turn off the news feeds. Uh, it's just, there's actually, that's, it's not news. I mean, it's, this is all old stuff, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know, what would be really news if, you know, people were actually kind and considerate and generous, that'd be real news. <laughs> So, again, you know, I don't, I don't think, you know, it, it, it's just at least a limit. Uh, but, you know, because, uh, you know, most people can't go cold, cold, cold turkey. Uh, but, uh, you know, to really, really limit the, 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 uh, the attention that one pays to the news and also to social media, I, I really don't. I don't see the benefit in it at all. Uh, and, you know, I hope that doesn't sound like a, you know, like a, 
uh, you know, an, an old Luddite who, you know, was, you know, just grumbling and complaining about this, this you know, modern, modern technology. Because it, it, the reality is we're, we're actually meeting using the technology <clears throat> and, and say, <clears throat> at a Bayagiri, I mean, we, 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 we use the technology to broadcast our uh, pujas on Saturdays and the Lunar Observance Days and our Dhamma talks. And, and uh, you know, so it's the, the technology is, is, is really useful, but it's what, what it, how do you use it so that it is actually of benefit rather than, than something that, that, that really just sucks your energy and and such your well-being uh, out and and uh, you know just you know leaves you kind of empty. Yeah, Lumpur, this is quite fascinating. I mean, you became an abbot in 1952. <clears throat> That's the year I was born, and I mean, you you've like started, um, you know, you started well. You continued work at Wat Banarachat, the international monastery, but basically helped to start uh, Wat Pujam Gam, Wat Daudam. What a Bayagiri. And these are places which I feel like find a really good balance, um, you know, between the traditionalism, you know, of Theravada Buddhism, where, you know, the teachings of the, the elders. But, you know, a Bayagiri is not a Luddite place, you know. I mean, as you said, you know, we're connect, you know, a Bayagiri is connected um, yeah. you know, to the internet and to the world. You're connected, you know, to the internet and to the world to some extent. But do you have any advice about how to how to balance that? The the tradition and and being simple, living simply, without, but also, yeah, acknowledging the that you know we are interrelated and you know this is a modern world and we're in a modern context. Well, yeah, we are in a modern world. We're in a modern context, but you know I don't think human nature has changed all that much. Um, you know, twenty five hundred years we're still suffering, so that that the the teachings of the Buddha are 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 completely relevant. Uh, today and and you know it's certainly one of the things that I appreciate <clears throat> about the uh, the uh, of course the Buddhist teaching but also the the, the Theravada uh, and particularly the say like the Thai forest tradition uh, is the one there's a connection to nature and that's really important um, <clears throat> it's not a and there is, a, 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 and it's something that, that is sometimes not really well understood <clears throat> in the uh, in the West uh, is how closely connected the monasteries are in, say, like in, in, in the Thai forest tradition and Thai Theravada in general with the society around it. Uh, they're just such a direct. So you you're 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 you really. I mean, one of the reasons is because of the way that the Buddha set things up. Um, you can't you can't really go for more than a day comfortably without having some contact with with the lay community and the lay society. You know, unless you want to fast. <laughs> And uh, most of us don't want to fast. <laughs> you know, we, I mean, I said, uh, I like to eat. So, <laughs> but but that, that reliance on 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 alms food is 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 a uh, creates a a, a a very direct um, link to the, the to the world of the uh, around us and. And its concerns and its difficulties, uh, and uh, and and gives an opportunity to respond in a, you know, hopefully, in a you know, in a wise and compassionate way. <clears throat> so then, uh, and then the the, the teachings uh, of the the Buddha that are you know preserved in the Pali Canon. I mean, the Pali Canon is very extensive, but uh, it has some basic 
themes that are not uh, uh, they're they're not really uh, uh, it's not complicated it's not it's not overly complicated or over philosophical philosophized about <clears throat> so four noble truths back to experience uh, dependent origination then the reality that that everything is built on a, a, a web of causes and conditions and to be able to uh, understand that nature of karma uh, whatever actions Whatever action I will do, for good or for ill, I, of that I will be the heir. Um, <clears throat> one has to reflect on that, uh, as well as the the uh, you know the on a certain level the mundane uh, aspects that you keep reviewing over and over again. Yeah, I'm of I'm of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. Uh, I'm of the nature to sicken. I'm not gone beyond. I'm of the nature to die. I'm not gone beyond dying. You can come up with intelligent, coherent, brilliant philosophies, but you're still going to get old and sick and die. <laughs> and if you don't figure that out, um, you know, you're, you know, it's it's you know, it's kind of uh, yeah, it's a bit a bit of a shame. Lamport. There's, I think, a fairly common mindset of people when they first encounter Theravada Buddhism and kind of come across these teachings in the Pali Canon, like one of the ones which you do find again and again is this encouragement towards seclusion, or you find these discourse on the, the rhinoceros horn. And it was certainly like monastics, you know, or, you know, <clears throat> certain type of someone who's new to Buddhism, they read these suttas and they're really inspired and they think, okay, seclusion and just practicing by myself, for myself, enlightenment, that's the way to go. But it sounds yeah. like, you know, you're talking about having a relationship with the world. And you gave a talk um, a while back about, it's about more than just us. And I'm curious if you could, could talk to how to balance these two things, these two truths, I guess. Well, I mean, the thing is, is, is I mean, it's kind of like, like, a, it's kind of like Ajahn Chah when he was asked, I mean, it, was, it was actually Jack Cornfield frustrated at Ajahn Chah's teaching. He said, you know, sometimes you teach us to do this, and sometimes you teach us to do that. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they don't go together. And, and it doesn't make, you know, and he was just really frustrated. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and Lumpa just kind of laughed and said, well, you know, really, all I'm doing is trying to, trying to, I'm looking at people, and they're walking down a road, and they're going off. To the left into into a ditch and you know getting they're going to wander off and get lost and i say go right go right and in the same and say oh yeah sometimes i see people going off to the right and gonna they're going to go off into the ditch and get lost in the bushes i say i go let go left go left and it's so the the teachings are balances so that and 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 the our western propensity for glorifying the individual picks up on the the teachings where the buddha says uh learn how to be on your own learn how to 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 be in solitude and 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 then we think that that's 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 everything but it overlooks you know all of the teachings where the Buddha is saying, uh, you know, you know, when when Ananda sort of say half of the holy life is is having good companionship, good friendships, uh, and and the Buddha said, no, it's not half the holy life; it's the whole of the holy life. So that 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 sense of, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's you can think, well, I, I can have good companionships without having to actually live with anybody. <laughs> Well, no. <laughs> uh, so that, that there's there there are times when it's really helpful to uh, to have solitude. It's really helpful to realize because as human beings, we're pretty hardwired to interact with each other. And certainly, uh, in 2,500 years ago, uh, in 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 Indian culture. Um, 
to be on your own uh, is like a, uh, I mean, it's like a, a, a punishment. <laughs> and, 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 but it's sort of like, well, the Buddha looking to, to try to get us to have a, an independence and freedom of heart. How do you, how, how do you, how do you learn how to be on your own? Uh, so that those, those two are, they're not mutually exclusive. They're both aspects of our being that we have to learn how to navigate and establish a sense of, of say, maturity and freedom within that. How do we live with other human beings uh, and not be completely neurotic and messed up about it? Uh, and uh, or just yeah, creating and making ourselves into a pain in the butt to others. Um, or how do we how do we learn to live on our own where we feel comfortable and 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 happy and and not uh, and not fearful of like oh god I got to go meet those people <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, and you know, go into paroxysms of proliferation, and because because of having to deal with people, so it's like it's like it's like how do we how do we not suffer in any condition? Yeah, thank you, Lomport. Uh, another like balancing question is, <clears throat> so you know, there's talk in the forest tradition, Ajahn Man talking about jitta or like the the primal mind or the the mind source, you gave a talk, or at least there's a talk that's titled um, that you gave called The Underlying Radiance of the Mind. And, you know, Ajahn Lumpur Samedo will talk about the need to trust, you know, trust, have faith, or, you know, believe in this underlying radiance of the mind and to really trust in it. And I, I feel like there have been times when I've asked you about this type of mind, and you've actually, you know, cautioned not like believing in it, but actually being wary of it like don't fool yourself so i'm curious if you could talk about the the balance between having faith in this original mind versus being skeptical of mm. something like that well i mean one of the things again it comes back to 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 suffering the it, the felt sense of how we how we relate to uh because uh, one of the you know what is it that makes us kind of unique <coughs> in in the uh, <coughs> in the realm of of uh, you know we have we have self-reflective minds you know as human beings and uh, so that we can reflect on ourselves and we can reflect on our experience uh, so then being able to <coughs> Take that reflection, you know. We can with that that reflection, we can turn it into, you know, more externalized, um, yeah, say intellectualizing of the world around us, uh, or turning it or idealizing it, and and and. <clears throat> And that is, that's actually separating ourselves from experience because it's, it is an idea and ideas are not a direct experience. And so that in terms of belief, it's not belief in terms of, of uh, you know, your traditional approach from, you know, I think from a, you know, Judeo-Christian perspective or Abrahamic religion perspective of, you know, you have to believe. Uh, and, and what, you know, the Buddha is, is saying, you have to experience this for yourself. Um, that sense of, you know, the nature of, of the Dhamma being, um, yeah, sanditiko, it's to be, to be seen. Each one, each you know, to to see for oneself, so that that uh, 
but it's not to be, how do you say, externalized or put outside of one's experience by making it a, a, a philosophy or a, or a belief system. <clears throat> belief is, <clears throat> is more an experience of, <clears throat> it's a faith experience. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, and sometimes that, that, that uh, <clears throat> it's hard to talk <clears throat> about, because that one, you know, our language is conditioned by our culture. And as soon as you talk about faith or belief, then, you know, we think in terms of, of our, you know, sort of our Western conditioning and, and expectation around that. Uh, but there is an element of, um, say, like, you know, wisdom. You know, wisdom is... is say in our uh, our tendency for wisdom uh, is to you know we we reflect on it we investigate it we we look at it carefully and there is a certain acceptance that's gained through that investigation and that analysis and certainly that that's actually one of the <clears throat> Uh, early descriptions of of, of Buddhism uh, when the, the 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 teaching of of the Buddhas was called a vibhajavadi. It was a it was a teaching of analysis, uh, and so the focus on wisdom, which is is uh, is important. I mean, the Buddha really was great at being able to step back and analyze things clearly. But analysis on its own is not going to uh, take one to a place of relinquishment and letting go uh, and, and, and surrender. Uh, so that that quality of faith or belief, which is more of a heart quality, yeah, you know, the uh, faith are, uh, 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 is much more willing to let go. Wisdom always wants a little bit more knowledge, <laughs> a little bit more information. <laughs> and, you know, so but you know, you're always looking at that the that, that, the the balance. But but certainly that 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 there is a place for for for, for faith and and belief in that sense of one has to give oneself. To the practice, one has to give oneself to the, to the you know, the willingness to you know, give oneself to truth, and to give oneself to the way things truly are, and, and not hold back anything. <clears throat> Thank you for those words. Um, you know, you, you speak about this determination to give oneself to to truth and. Um, you know, embodying faith and aligning one's life with these, these values and this real vision of Dhamma. I'm curious how you would, you know, I, I know so many people right now who it feels like, uh, in the words of Ajahn Sona, they've got one foot in the monastery and one foot on a banana peel. And, you know, it's like they, they've had this insight, they've you know, seeing the power of the Dhamma, and yet they find themselves in worldly conditions, which are, are difficult, and just trying to find peace in that situation. Um, what advice would you give to such, to such folk, uh, Longpore? Well, I, one is that, you know, not to, uh, um, not to overlook the power of the because oftentimes we want to find a resolution either through view or through practice. Like I, if I only got the right practice down, then I would. But they 
overlook the power of yeah of giving oneself to say just to virtue and integrity um, of generosity and compassion those are 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 are, are overlooked because they're kind of they're kind of you know you know a bit kind of you know it's wet <laughs> mushy <laughs> but it's, but it's you know it, it, it's it's but it's really easy to overlook how 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 transformative that is and and in that sense of trust of one's trust of oneself and trust in dhamma um you know really comes from from experience uh and and uh you know you have to you have to put the teachings into into practice and and and, and live it you can't you, you can't you, you can't really hold back and and wait for you know conditions to be right or for or to get you know real you know absolute clear confirmation that you're doing things right because as long as there's that doubt there it's, you know you're, you're the mind will just just uh, uh, it'll exploit that <clears throat> well this speaks to um i've heard uh you when asked what sort of the determining quality in monastic staying in robes was i think you referenced stubbornness uh as one of them at least and i would appreciated that um would you mind uh speaking to to that or to this um you know there is such a focus on high attainment and meditation but one thing that i've really felt uh i've seen within um the monastery is is the power of sila and faith um beautifully held to clean the heart in ways that sometimes you know that pure focus on technique that's so raised up in the west just doesn't manage to um you know the whole discourse on effacement and all the ways that practice manifests what is your feeling yeah. on, on that that aspect of the path and how it inter interlocks with Western Buddhism at the moment, which is so focused on technique. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly exactly it. There's that, those those uh, again those those fundamental qualities that are part and parcel of the yeah the path leading to the ending of suffering. Um, it, it's quite explicit uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> You know, we'd all like to have a shortcut. <laughs> you know, we'd all like it to be easy, um, but uh, you know, it 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 just doesn't uh, it doesn't always work that way. Um, so just being willing to, to stick with the uh, with, and, and you know, and obviously it, it takes a, a humility and. Uh, you know, real, real commitment to reflective investigation, uh, to to understand these, the, this, this more clearly. Um, but I think it's really helpful to keep grounding oneself in these fundamental roots um, uh, that 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 nourish the nourish the dhamma. <clears throat> Longpur, if you um, if you had to give young Abbot Longpur Pasano two pieces of advice, um, or two new monks who aren't actually abbots but are you know up here in Seattle doing doing something, um, what would that advice be if we could ask? Uh, let's see. I mean, I would certainly. Uh, um, I just. Be a lot more kind to yourself and to others. Uh, you know, be a lot more patient with yourself and with others. Uh, that's that's kind of the, you know, that certainly uh, 
that sense of, of uh, uh, you know, those are probably the, um, you know, I, I, you know, I was an abbot and teaching and resp holding responsibilities and, and, and all of that. And, and, uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I was able to cr create a fair amount of suffering for myself and I keep it going for quite some time. <laughs> Boy, that's such a such a kind answer, um, and it kind of touches not specifically on on being an abbot, but just uh, this dynamic of like having projects versus being, like doing versus being. And you've yeah. done a lot of both. I mean, you've started all these different monasteries, and the monasteries that you've started are the ones that have been around, you know, the longest, you know, or yeah. some of the longest. And uh, yeah, you know, there are some monks who say, you know, give. You know everything to being you know there's no place for for projects you know i've had um you know sometimes there's an encouragement yet yeah, young monks or monks shouldn't have projects you know you should just be meditating like something like this and i'm curious about what you would say about that the balance there well you know the the balance is is uh you know is different for each person and different at different times for each person you know, so that that uh, you know, there's not a there's not a categorical answer for that. Um, but you know, there is a a uh, you know, because because there's also you, uh, again, it's a category in terms of, I mean, what kind of what kind of doing and what kind of being? Because you know, there's there's <laughs> there's some of these meditators. There's, there's this great uh, you know, from the suttas and, you know, and he meditates and he out meditates and he mis meditates, <laughs> you know, he's doing, he's, yeah, he's meditating, but, uh, you know, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, so, uh, but then, you know, also doing, you know, it's, you know, can, uh, you know, there are things that, that uh, I think it's important that, that in, in, in that, doing that there is a sense of uh you know what am i doing it for what benefit what what value is there in it um uh, and and not just in terms of um personal aggrandizement or personal sense of accomplishment but in terms of of you know, how how are others benefiting from this <clears throat> And so that that's a, that's an important aspect of of doing. But then also, you know, when does the doing bleed over into um, a uh, a sense of of uh, um, you know, a sense of self that is is needed to be propped up, needed to be kind of it's. <laughs> When the image that comes up is, you know, in in uh, the, there used to be a there was a there was a, a commercial craze where people there was a, where people were buying pet rocks, you know, you know so it's like looking after a pet rock, and then <laughs> so, <one of> the, <laughs> so you know, it's just trying to try to squeeze something out of of uh, uh, you know experience for me. It's, it's not very useful. That's a good metaphor. <laughs> um, yeah. I <laughs> uh, love for, um, I have two questions. I don't know which one you'll gravitate more to, but, but either one I'd be very interested in. Um, one is in this balance of helping versus looking to one's own practice. Um, you know, I, for me, there's never really been a, um, I've seen those two roots get conceptualized and maybe problematically uh, distinguished into the Bodhisattva and the Arahant paths. And yeah. I've never really felt that tension in myself. I sort of feel what my practice is and that feels correct, but I am curious how you interact with that very common uh, distinction that you, you see held up in two circles. And I know several practitioners who are trying to navigate that maybe they 
you know, have a strong leaning towards the suttas, but they find themselves in a, another program and there's a lot of power to the bodhisattva ideal. Um, so actually, I, I, that, I, there's another question, but that one I am very interested in actually in your take on. Uh, and to me, it's a false dichotomy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, again, you're, you're, you're as, a, uh, as a practitioner, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're really are, or as a human being, you know, we're in contact with, with other human beings. And, uh, you know, are we um, contributing to the well-being and happiness of, of others? Or are we contributing to the increase of suffering and difficulty? Um, and, um, you know, and certainly the, the, the goal of the, of the Bodhisattva is to decrease suffering. And, and the goal of, the, you know, say within a classic, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it's a false dichotomy, the whole sort of Arahant Bodhisattva thing. And, and you know, to, to think that somebody like Ajahn Chah was a selfish Arahant, I mean, that's, that's I mean, uh, uh, and, and so many of the, 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 uh, uh, the monks that, uh, uh, teachers that I've seen and and lived with. I mean, they're deeply steeped in the in the kind of classical Theravada, um, but their uh, their their response to the human condition is one of yeah, one of com compassion and energy. <clears throat> These are not, and, you know, even somebody like. You know, you know, somebody, some say like Lopa Liam, who, you know, on the surface looks like a completely detached uh, uh, being, who uh, you know, steeped in equanimity, um, but uh, you know, it's really hard to keep up with him because <laughs> he's. You know he's he's deeply involved in helping people, uh, and you know the the monastics in in his own community, the monastics around him, the lay community, the society in general. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, yeah, it's hard to you know, hard to hard to keep up. I mean, you just have to. I mean, I think like the I the you know, we had to do that with Ajahn Chah. You'd have a <clears throat> you know, you would, you would have a, a daytime upatak and a nighttime upatak as an attendant, personal attendant looking after a need. Because one attendant looking after these, a senior monk like that, you, you, just, you just die. <laughs> you just can't, you, you, yeah, you know, you can't, can't keep up with them. So that, that uh, you know, it is a, to me, it's a false dichotomy. It's much more around the, the uh, um, you know, the, the response to, to, uh, uh, to the human condition and, and, uh, and that, that uh, the, uh, certainly the, um, you know, that was, you know, in the early, you know, of course, uh, you know, in, in Buddhist history, uh, it began being, <clears throat> or, you know, it, it drifted into a very hard uh, or clear dichotomy. Um, but in the, in historically, the arising of the Bodhisattva ideal um, was, you know, when you look at the <laughs> the vows of the bodhisattva and it's it's all it's, it's basically it's a reconfiguring of the four noble truths you know seeing suffering and vowing to 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 uh, uh, overcome it <clears throat> thank you i'm curious with um i know people who are working with marriage and relationship in in two different ways one is, and I'd be curious about your advice for both. Um, one is those who kind of embarked on this path but have a spouse who is 
not quite on board or at least not nearly at the same level um, of interest and and how they kind of work with that balancing a relationship with actually you know really pursuing a path that they've found real meaning in and the second is in the case that both partners are actually deeply passionate about the dhamma and how how they morph that relationship into one that's that's a really helpful dharmic partnership and if you've seen any helpful tips for practitioners dealing with both of those scenarios well i think certainly the uh when one is 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 has taken on uh, marriage uh, and uh, then one has to be attentive to the, uh, the the needs of one's partner and and uh, and to not work from expectations not not transposing one's own expectations onto onto the the, the partner it's, it's a uh, um, it's, that's not an act of kind of love and you know it's it's a uh, it's kind of selfish uh, so, so that that sense of of <clears throat> being able to okay one has one's because there's you know one has a, a certain independence uh, and and uh, but not uh, because oftentimes the you know the feeling of uh, kind of separation or distance that comes is usually because of you know, kind of expectation and wanting uh, one wanting another person to fulfill some ideal of themselves of the, for them and then for oneself trying to fulfill some ideal of external, one's measuring it externally. I need to practice or live in a certain way. Uh, and, <clears throat> and so those are both kind of limited ways of perceiving and relating. Uh, so that learning how to tune more clearly into, like for a, a spouse that is, because you can't expect uh, people to I mean, it's, it's just even living in a monastery. I mean, you've lived in monasteries. Uh, people are definitely not the same. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, and you know, you can't, you can't expect people to be the same, to have the same interests or values or commitment. And but you know, you can have a, you can have commitments to that are. You know, there's certain fundamental commitments that are 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 uh, <clears throat> are, are necessary or important. I mean, you want to <clears throat> you want to have a foundation of of of, uh, of trust, um, and that's where the sila is really important. Uh, that commitment to to sila and trusting in that person as a as a as a, as a person of integrity and treating them in that way <clears throat> and and then you know what it, but then not 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 transposing one's kind of expectations of, of uh, them performing in a certain way or being in a certain way or doing certain things uh, because that's that's uh, I mean one uh, it's just what <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hopeless anyway uh and and but it's also a a uh, you know people will, will will resist um you know if, if it's not something and that's what you know, one is of course the foundation of trust but then also there really needs to be a, a, a that kind of kindness and 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 relationship of you know how do how do we do this for our you know mutual well-being and and if there's children then how do we do it for the 
well-being of, of, of children. So it's a, you know, that, those are hard things to be doing, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's important that, uh, that, that there isn't that <clears throat> kind of um, expectation or demand placed on each other and, and, and to lay that foundation of trust. Uh, you know, for uh, uh, within a, a relationship where there there is a you know commitment of to to spiritual practice, spiritual values that are very very similar, <clears throat> then it's it's just is is you know how do we how do we work together to um, strengthen uh, those uh, uh, those those fundamental uh, spiritual foundations. Uh, like they, they what is the was Sanda Sutta Jaka Banya, and the faith, learning, generosity, wisdom, um, those qualities. So how do we how do we mutually support each other in that 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 cultivation? Uh, and that's a, that I think uh, those are the four qualities that the Buddha pointed to. To uh, uh, there's a couple that were. Um, married for a long time. I can't remember the names right now. Nakula Mata. Nakula. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, yeah the Nakula Mata, Nakula Pita. And, uh, and, uh, and when the Buddha is saying that, yeah, what, what, you know, and this will be the, the qualities that will draw you together in the next life. <coughs> That's what <coughs> holds you together in this life, is what draws you together in the next life. <coughs> Well, boy, that's a beautiful answer. And I mean, on the side of, um, yeah, family life, you you really could have you know, succeeded in many different things, but you've really chosen to give your life to establishing monasteries. And monasteries, you know, that's one aspect of, of Buddhism, traditional Buddhism, which many Westerners, many, Ameri many Americans don't yet really see the value of. And you've given your life to it. You've been a monk for 48 Something. Yeah, this is the 49th coming up next 49. month. So, <laughs> and you've been an abbot. I mean, I'm 39, so you've been an abbot for 39 years. And um, so that's impressive. But what is the value of monasteries? What would you say to someone who didn't yet didn't yet see that value? Uh, well, I mean, that's that's you think, well, in a, in a society of abundance, like <clears throat> like like we have now, I mean, there is an abundance of material things. Uh, there's an abundance of possessions. There's an abundance of, of everything. What there is a paucity of is good spiritual examples, places of, of safety and refuge where you can go and feel safe. You can you can be in that space and kind of relax, you know? and and that's that's something that this 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 society is inc it's an incredible short supply. <clears throat> so that monasteries are 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 that uh, you know that, that's ideally that's that's what a good monastery can do is provide a. A, 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 a physical place of refuge, of community, of uh, of refuge and safety. Thank you, Longpore. And um, I think the place you set up in Abayagiri in large measure was responsible for both of our going forth. Um, so, you know, we have a great deal to owe, or to, we owe you a great deal. And, um, <laughs> Thank you for, we know you have the meal um, and we just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us, Slungpur. It means, it means the world. Yeah, it was good to see you both. So take care and look after yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do good, refrain from evil, <laughs> purify the mind, keep at it. <laughs> Our best. Great advice, thank you.